I'll touch a bit on the, on the discoveries. Um, and then what is Namibia share of these discoveries? We'll, we'll briefly talk about that. And then we'll focus on the projected uh, pre aggressive cash flows. We'll go into uh, a bit of local content. We'll look at the opportunities for economic diversification. And then we'll look at uh, employment and job creation and potential for business for the year. So, Ms. Nagashole was telling us about how the oil and gas is formed and the processes that lead uh, to us to discover this oil. So, on this slide, you can see an overview of the discoveries that we have, uh, the year they were discovered, plus the liquid that is discovered. So, notably, the Kudu, as our chairperson has mentioned, it's, it has been about 48 uh, years uh, since uh, this activity started. And uh, what was discovered there is gas. So on the, let me just see if my pointer is working. I don't think it's working. So on the map, on the right, you can see the red color, which denotes the gas field. Uh, and the green one is denoting the oil field. So what was discovered last year is the graph, uh, Venus and Larona. And this year, we have made discoveries of uh, Jonga and um, to a lesser extent, the same. So as you can see on the last column on the, on the table, there are some discoveries where a preliminary development concept is already being considered. What that means is that uh, the, joint, the joint venture partners are already looking at the most optimum way to bring this oil to the surface. So I just want to point out that at this point, we are still doing a pressure. We are trying to confirm what are the commercial quantities of oil that are there, what is the best way to produce it, and what are the properties of the reservoir to make sure that it won't damage it and that we leave the lasting and long term sustainable revenue stream for the government. So, where are we uh, in all of these projects? Um, the dotted orange line shows uh, today's date, and uh, the horizontal lines with different colors are showing where we are in terms of uh, progress, uh, I mean, project maturity of each one of the projects. So, for the Kuru field, this is the most advanced one, as you can probably tell, this has been the first one to be discovered. We are at the stage that is called FIT, so FIT means front end engineering design. You can read that as feasibility, basically. And um, we are looking at reaching uh, final investment decision. This is the point where all the contracts are signed and all the resources are, are, are basically committed for the construction and uh, the development. Uh, those will be the that, that, that Sarah was talking about. So we estimate that this FID will be reached um, this time next year uh, so that first production of gas will be was the end of 2026. So for the oil discoveries, uh, in terms of containers and Jonga, these are uh, these timelines are, are closely matching. Uh, we are doing pre feasibility right now, so our appraisal is ongoing. So there are a different concepts which we still have to sit down and, and select which one is the best in terms of optimizing value, cost, and uh, proportion. So, first point for this discovery is estimated to be towards the end of uh, 2029 and beginning of 2030. So, that is, of course, depending on the outcome. Uh, so, now that we know and we are, are expecting that point to flow around 2029 and 2030 and could be earlier, probably 2026, um, if everything goes well. What is our government uh, standing to take? So, on this slide, uh, I would like to draw your attention to the fiscal features of our petroleum agreement, which is the instrument that is governing all the operations of uh, oil and gas in Namibia. So, uh, um, related to the question that the general asked, do we have money to take uh, these activities ourselves to spend our money? The answer is, is, is we have gotten it, and our chairperson has elaborated uh, is that the investors come in, they spend their money, they discover the 
fuel, they appraise, and then after that, they commit to producing this fuel. And once these fields reach production in that oil or gas, this is the amount of, uh, of, of, of fuel that the Namibian government um, would take from all available uh, cash flows and uh, proceedings from this field. So as you can see, there is a share of royalties, about 5% of that cash flow, there's only income tax after all the expenses, uh, OPEX and CAPEX, operating expenditure and capital expenditure has been removed. And typically, Dambo um, has a 10% share in all of the licenses, so 10% of that comes to Dambo. Uh, depending on whether the field is performing very well, additional profits tax uh, by picking. Uh, this is negotiable between 5 to 12 uh, percent and of course contribution to, to, to uh, annual contribution to the claim tax. So on the right side you can see how the pie chart is but the key takeaway from this is that although um, we may not invest uh, directly into this other people coming to invest, once the proceedings of, of uh, are flowing from uh, this oil fields, the investor will only take about 36 percent while the rest will remain in Namibia uh, through uh, different uh, fiscal instruments. So um, there have been always questions that you know, that um, um, how do we convey to to our peers? Uh, are people getting more? Are we getting less? Are we getting more? And why they are getting less? And so on. so on this table you can see. Uh, that in the second row, our, our, our petroleum tax is actually one of the highest. Um, plus, of course, we have um, additional profit tax. This could be because our, our system is, is, is a concession system, but you can see South Africa as well is also a concession system. So what it means by concession system is that uh, investors come in, they get an exclusive license to explore and to produce and they are obliged to share whatever they are finding uh, with the government. Um, so I just want to, to comment on this slide that uh, our, our fiscal terms are not uh, on the most aggressive side such that they are chasing away investors and as you can see we are enjoying the presence of, of our world's um, major oil companies currently and it's basically uh, this fiscal regime that is attracting them. So, as the chairperson was saying, it keeps a balance between what the investor is benefiting and, of course, what uh, the assets and dividends are benefiting. And as you can see, most of the terms that we have uh, are actually uh, quite big. So, this is just another slide to see where we are. You can see the, in the middle of the, of the graph that we are not in the, in the, in the extreme high side. And so I think as a start we are on the, the spot where we need to understand. So um, I want to start by saying that we are although we are still in the appraisal stage, uh, of course we have uh, our preliminary focus and the summary mentioned and for is the custodian of all the petroleum data. So we are always um, doing our in-house studies and Forecasts and uh, um, trying to understand what is coming in the future so that we are better prepared. So, this is an example of what are the proceedings that we would expect from a typical projects such as uh, Venus. Uh, as you can see on the left side, uh, government is, is, is supposed to, to take about 67% of all the proceeds of things from the cash flow. This is, of course, mm -hmm. contract specific. Um, the graph in the middle is uh, denoting uh, the cash flows, uh, basically the flow of money. The light green uh, is showing free cash flows, uh, basically what is being uh, and what is left for, for net of the taxes. And the one that I want to draw your attention to is the grayish olive green one. I think it's brown, brownish green, the one in the middle. So that is showing the proceedings uh, to the government. Uh, as, you can, uh, as you can remember, I mentioned that uh, first oil is expected around 2030. So you can see it starts at around 2030. 
speaking around 2037 when the field will have been ground up to the maximum where uh, it has reached the stage that we hope to achieve. So this is basically where it has reached the maximum and it's, it's sustained at that point for a number of years. On the right side, you can see the cumulative uh, uh, cash flows uh, to the government in, 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 uh, in comparison to the net uh, the free cash flows. So as you can see, the government take uh, cash flows are much higher than the cash flows that are going to invest. So in summary, as we, as we uh, saw in the last presentation, uh, this requires huge investments but this will also bring huge benefits. So now that we are looking at all those benefits, I'm sure that 70 billion companies is, uh, is drawing attention. So now that we, we, we know about those numbers, what can this do uh, to Namibia? So of course we expect positive uh, social economic impact. Uh, the initial estimates from the two projects that I was highlighting, uh, uh, that the boost development concepts are already underway, are estimated to double the Namibian GDP by about 2040. And between 2033 and 2043, oil and gas will be contributing an average of about 17 billion per annum to our GDP. So, what that will mean is that uh, oil alone, or the oil and gas alone, will be almost a uh, contributing half of, of Namibia's GDP uh, during that time. In a peak production, uh, an aggregate of estimated revenue from the royalties, uh, corporate tax, uh, additional profit tax, if there's any number of revenues, will be breaking in about 5.6 billion per annum in, uh, in, uh, in state revenue. So, at the, at the bottom, you can see how our GDP is in a solid line. Uh, and you can see how it will be impacted positively in the service current state, both direct value added, indirect value added, and uh, reduced uh, value. So, um, our colleague Ramona, who is our executive for human capital, always said if you can have resources, but if you don't know how to use them, it's, uh, it's useless. So, I know many of you are thinking, what about? Dutch disease. What about the resource case? We have heard a lot of stories of uh, countries that have discovered oil, but they have not uh, done any good with it, and it has turned into a case rather than a blessing for them. Of course, there are risks and there are opportunities that we have to address, and I'm going to briefly uh, cover these risks and these opportunities. So, what we have to avoid, of course, is um, is, uh, is that potential to neglect gas and other associated resources uh, that come with these discoveries that will uh, result in us for going value. So for us to make use of the full value, we have to monetize actually all our gas and everything else that is associated with these discoveries. So <coughs> local content. So our honorable minister was talking about local content and how it's a tool for really uh, driving value to, to uh, uh, the local community. So, poor local content policies will result in us eroding uh, this value. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, for example, if we take the approach, and, and, and I like what, what the minister said, if you, if you, uh, you are somebody else, you will, uh, you will probably say it, but if we take that uh, approach that the only guess will only be there, like and end up being only a few people who don't have the pool of resources and the technical capability to, to properly manage the the, uh, the, uh, the supply chains and the logistics and we end up losing them. So proper local content and policies are, are very are very yeah, important. Also we should avoid dependency uh, on oil revenues alone. So Shiwana was mentioning that we have potential to really diversify our economy and uh, our political system will give uh, a detailed case that look at how we can try to diversify the oil revenues uh, into building new economies in this country. 
Uh, we shouldn't forego specialist training as we may be uh, not properly equipped to answer most of the pain. And then we should, uh, as our chairperson has, has, has spoken about the, the fiscal regime, we don't need to change anything drastically that will result in either losses to the government or losses to the investor is that we um, uh, halt the continuity of, uh, of, of, of this value. What opportunities do we have? Um, to be really frank, the opportunities are endless. So we have direct opportunities, indirect opportunities, induced opportunities. Uh, in terms of, of energy, we know that our country is currently energy poor. We are importing most of our, our energy from our neighbors. Uh, if we monetize oil and gas um, properly, we can actually construct a power, uh, a gas to power plant, which will uh, be, which will make Namibia energy self-sufficient and then as a clean energy powerhouse, we can even start exporting this power. Also, we have an opportunity to kickstart our downstream industry. Uh, would we look at the, the, at the, the commercial environment case of the, the oil refinery, for example? Those are all the questions that we, 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 we can uh, pose to ourselves. Uh, domestic source of alternative fuel for Namibia's key industries, uh, as I mentioned, uh, molecular background in order. Education and training, there's a lot of opportunities. According to the petroleum laws, uh, companies are uh, obliged to train Namibians or provide towards uh, training of Namibia. <coughs> Namibians, we can get the opportunity to harness renewable energies by really creating these synergies with the petroleum industry. So, um, the local content, as the minister has highlighted, is, is really the tool that will uh, enable that so positive social economic impact. Uh, I'm not going to, to, to dive uh, deep into this, but I just want to draw your attention to the three key strategies uh, that the local content, which is currently in draft form, um, uh, is aiming to, to achieve. So, ensuring the transfer of technology, knowledge, and skills to the Namibians. Maximizing the employment and development of Namibia, maximizing the participation of local suppliers along the value chain. So let's have those strategies in mind as, as I proceed forward, and you will I, you will see how this will impact the opportunities that I will, I will, I will touch on in the next week. So the Minister of Mines and Energy is the regulator is the custodian of this uh, of this policy, and NAMCO is the we like as, as, as by law, the technical advisor to the, the, to the government will have that function of uh, providing inputs and, um, and um, from industry side, really helping the government to ensure that this policy is successfully uh, implemented. So, I want us to consider a case study. Uh, as Shuana has, has alluded to, we have been, for the past uh, one and a half years, we have been uh, doing a lot of benchmarking to try to learn from what others have done correctly and what others were supposed to do. I mean, we have done better, and the idea is for us really to, to, to make sure that we don't fall into the same pothole that they felt, that they felt, and for us to, to, to do better. So, Sovereign wealth funds uh, as an economic diversification tool. Uh, we mentioned Norway, where they started their production in 1971. Um, about uh, 20 years later, uh, the government through parliament passed a law to establish a government petroleum fund. Its approach is really long term investment, having the youth and have to make sure that. These values uh, that the value that is derived from the oil and gas is preserved for the future generations. In 1996, they are first deposit was made, and uh, the, as you can see on the slide at number four, the fund was um, was uh, focusing on uh, fixed assets uh, and equity. So towards the years, they have uh, uh, established an ethical guidelines. Uh, uh, in an ethical committee which oversees the operations of the fund to ensure that ethical investment without corruption and all of these things and they diversified into unlisted assets in Russia, in, 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 
in Asia, Africa, um, and also they incorporated real estate and so on. So the moral of these stories are um, that Norway's um, oil fund is set up with a long-term view, and usually in life is end up those who succeed are those who have uh, long-term view. And um, they also make sure that they put policies in place uh, to make sure that the fund is properly run. They have appointed an independent uh, manager of this fund. And the result of all that is that the fund has been growing, steadily and diversifying uh, uh, its focus, such that today it's worth 1.5 trillion US dollars. So you can see, only from 1996 up to now, it has amassed uh, 1.5 trillion US dollars. On this slide, um, on the top right, where you have the green bus, um, okay, where you green? Uh, I want to you to recognize something in form of here that all these funds are in form. So this is showing the world's largest solar and North funds. Most of these funds that are here are actually funded from oil and gas facilities. Of course, we have the Norway one, which is the top one. We have the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, the white one. Um, and we have the Qatar Investment Authority. And all these are in form, they are funded but we know from Norway, for example, and as the minister was alluding to, that um, uh, they, they, are, they are one of the most uh, um, energy transition conscious nations in Europe. Uh, I'm sure our political leader who uh, takes care of sustainable energy in can, can confirm with us that they possess the, the highest number of electric vehicles. Europe. Yet, most of their wealth is derived from oil and gas. So what this is teaching us is that we have to use our oil resources to create prosperity for, for, our, for our country. So, as you can see at the bottom of, of, of the blue graphs there, around 2021, this Norway fund was actually worth about 250,000 US dollars per Norwegian citizen, meaning that the value of this fund is actually about 250,000 times the population of, 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 um, of Norway in that point. So, can we replicate this? If you ask me, if I'm just waking up, I would say a confident yes. So, I have shared in one, in one of the previous slides the risks and the opportunities that we have to take. And if Namibia follows the good lessons that we have learned from these countries who have done so, we have the potential and more to actually replicate uh, what Norway and the other countries have done. Uh, we are very, very happy to learn that uh, our country has established a sovereign government last year. And one key data that you will notice is that we didn't have to wait for 20 years. We didn't have to wait for, the, for 20 years after production. We actually we found this before the oil has been uh, extracted itself. So I'm sure by the time that the production comes, we are, we are ready. Uh, proper governance policies of this uh, fund will be in place, and we will keep up that uh, massive growth. So if you want more information on the, on the which are fund, of course, you can go to the Bank of Namibia website, and uh, there you can find its, uh, its uh, strategies and, and strategies. So these two graphs are showing production profiles. Uh, the one on the left is showing the Norwegian historical production uh, of all fields, and the one on the right is showing uh, the Namibian forecasted uh, production and profiles of two fields only. So as you can see on the scale in the middle where you have you see the 400, you can see that. Our production, our estimated production in two fields only will probably surpass the highest production that Norway has averaged, which was about 1999-2001. So, as our discoveries, uh, you may have noted that we have, um, I mean, one of my previous slides, we have multiple discoveries, uh, but here I'm only talking about two fields. What that is telling us is that we are, we are taking 
any criminal uh, development approach. So many projects will come on stream pending their positive appraisal, of course, and we expect a comparable amount of cash flows to the government that the Norwegian government has been getting since their production started. But this is telling us, just confirming that that answer that I gave you when I just woke up. So, so what is the potential for uh, for the economy diversification? So, uh, again, the sovereign wealth fund is one of the most effective tools for for economy diversification, and we can take uh, two approaches. We can uh, try to diversify in the energy sector by strengthening it uh, and really using this money from the from the oil discoveries to make sure that we harness all the potential in the energy sector. And we can also tend to a wider economy and uh, really fund the government agendas. So from the energy perspective, we can um, uh, put up gas to power. Um, we can actually do value addition to our kind of carbons by focusing on the on the on the midstream and upstream industries gas processing, LPG, oil refinery, and uh, we can look regionally for opportunities for us to to to, to, um, uh, to channel that, that value and reap benefit by um, tapping into the Southern Af Af Africa uh, um, power markets, uh, gas exports to, to some countries, we can look at domestic gas and, and, and so on. We can also, as uh, our, our colleague Karenka, um, we take zero cost sustainable energy school and uh, a little later. We can use the recoveries, I mean the, the, the revenues from uh, oil and gas to kickstart our renewable um, uh, energy space. Elsewhere in the wider economy, uh, we can diversify to building national infrastructure that not only improve uh, the livelihood of the Namibians, but can also be used as a way of government to make income. We can invest this money into national development schemes such as basic electrification, basic water sanitation, and SME funding. I know as, 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 um, as young people, you would have very good entrepreneurial ideas, but you don't have funding for the project. So some of this money may be channeled to institutions such as the European Bank of Namibia and can be used to, to fund uh, innovative use to stimulate other sectors of the economy, such as agriculture, which is really important for us as we try to, 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 to secure uh, food security in Namibia. And we can also channel it to, to other uh, uh, facilities such as uh, gas floating and regasification storages, and of course, or we can augment our port capacity. We all know, for example, that right now, and DRC and Zambia is a lot of uh, copper mining going in there, but they are exporting their, their copper to other ports. If we improve our rate, for example, then this, this um, uh, export can be channeled through, through our country, and this not only increases the capacity of our port, but also gives our government uh, additional income. So, in terms of direct employment, um, from Two projects are alone. Our pre appraisal estimates are, uh, are saying that we would uh, expect uh, uh, that these two projects to generate about 3,600 jobs a week. But um, as you know, we anticipate more projects to come on stream later, so this number will only in increase. Direct jobs of over 600, um, we are talking about bona fide specialists in the of this industry. Indirect jobs and cost induced, which would include things that are not related to the, uh, to the oil and gas at all. This is perhaps the most important slide uh, of my presentation. I would want to invite the youth to really uh, pay attention to this slide. Um, I would start off by saying we should be prepared, as our colleagues have already said, if we are better prepared and we are standing in the actions of taking those opportunities. So we should not only target everyone to be employed at Namco, to be employed at Shell and so on, but we should target, and we should also have in mind the indirect and the induced opportunities that the oil discoveries are bringing. If you look at the center of the, of the of this uh, 
graphic where you have the oil ring. This is where the oil and gas operations themselves are. So this is uh, the guys that are the rig extracting the oil and so on. So they will, as you can imagine, there will be limited participation by Namibian companies. Eh? As we do not, first of all, we do not process the amount of money to buy this rig. We do not yet have the skills and technical capacity to carry out uh, these activities. However, as we move outside of this graphic, this is where the opportunities are increasing for local content, for our youth and for our, our people, small companies. Opportunities, um, specialist opportunities such as uh, selling of spare parts, opportunities are, as you can see, this is a wide variety of opportunities that are being created. So if you, if you align yourself now and you set up, for example, the company that will um, do custom clearance, for example, there will be a lot of, of uh, logistics, a lot of um, uh, imports and exports um, going on. So you can actually align yourself to, 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 to come up with the custom clearance. You can do catering, you can do training, you can uh, do waste management, you can do plant, uh, you can set up a security company to, to guard uh, some of the uh, the, um, the onshore uh, bases, medical services, warehousing, communications. If you have some some money, you can acquire some trades in town as, as, as experts are coming. These are all the opportunities that you can make money from. It's, um, it's, um, you'll be able to get uh, rental. So what I want to draw to your attention is that um, you should look at the indirect and induced uh, social economic impact because that's where those are the low hanging fruits where where uh, almost everyone you you can be sitting there and then you say aha i'm going to set up a, a company that uh, i don't know sells the additional clothes to the experts i mean the 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 opportunities are are, are really are really endless uh, in the, in the spin of industries so we come to the million dollar question now you are asking uh, and I'm sure you have gotten some answers, but you are still asking, what's in it for the for the youth? So all of these are the opportunities or are, are, the, are the categories. Uh, this is just amongst the opportunities that are for the youth. Uh, so if you want to work with uh, a direct job in the hydrocarbon industry, you can get a blue collar job. Um, the colleagues who went to BTC, they did the uh, welding, oil and making operators and so on. This is in fact uh, the highest number of uh, jobs that will be offered. Uh, as we expect to have um, uh, logistics camps, um, multiple multiple um, uh, teams that are working on the vessels and, and, and so on. You can, uh, for our entrepreneurs and the business minded youth, you can look at all the opportunities uh, and this with, with a local content policy uh, to be enforced uh, soon. This will really benefit you as, as um, it will favor our youth and our local companies to take up opportunities in the oil and gas industry. Community development, often oil and gas projects have a corporate social uh, responsibility uh, component which uh, entails improving the communities, building infrastructure and so on. So, so the youth are, are, are Opposed to, to, to benefit from that. Study opportunities and skills development. And as my colleague Ramona is, um, will, um, who's our uh, executive community capital, will have to promote. There will be a lot of study opportunities for, for the youth where you can secure lucrative scholarships and a chance for just integration after you have finished your studies. Why collar jobs? Um, so for example, if you want to follow the trajectory that, um, that um, our principal just said, this is following, for example, the opportunities are there for you to pursue a specialized career which, uh, which will be rewarding in, in, in the oil and gas. And these skills can be used uh, to other industries as well. Uh, global experience, you will have a chance to mingle with other like minded people elsewhere in the world and that could give you an opportunity for you to come back to the media, learn from that first experiences and you know, apply a positive impact to, to, to our country. 
We've got Renda and Sustainable Opportunities uh, as the world is moving towards um, energy transition and uh, the cleaner energies. It provides an opportunity uh, for you to, to um, for innovative uh, professionals to contribute environmentally to important uh, aspects such as carbon culture, for example, and energy transition as our uh, colleague Alan Kapp will speak to. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, um, I would like to conclude that there will be unprecedented socioeconomic benefits uh, if this appraisal, ongoing appraisal campaign is positive, that Namibia will stand to benefit. And we should avoid pitfalls and grass opportunities if we want to turn our discoveries into a blessing. And Namibia has an, an opportunity of, of um, amassing significant uh, state revenues, which we be used uh, to fund a sovereign law fund, and this in turn can be used as a tool to diversify our economy. And the field development programs of discoveries, since they are taking a multi place approach, um, we we want to advise that the local content implementation should also take uh, a similar approach. And what that means is that opportunities will be increasing uh, for the Namibians in the coming years. And ladies and gentlemen, with that, I would like to thank you and I'm inviting some questions.